Chapter 5 of Buried Alive by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 5 Alice on Hotels. She was wearing the same red roses. Oh, she said very quickly, pouring out the words generously from the inexhaustible mine of her good heart. I'm so sorry I missed you Saturday night. I can't tell you how sorry I am. Of course, it was all my fault. I oughtn't have got into the lift without you. I ought to have waited. When I was in the lift, I wanted to get out, but the lift man was too quick for me. And then on the platforms, while there was such a crowd, it was useless. I knew it was useless. And you not having my address, either. I wonder whatever you would think of me. My dear lady, he protested, I can assure you I blamed only myself. My hat blew off and... Did it now? She took him up breathlessly. Well, all I want you to understand, really, is that I'm not one of those silly sort of women that go losing themselves. No, such a thing's never happened to me before, and I shall take good care. She glanced round. He'd paid both the cabmen who were departing, and he and Mrs. Alice Chalice stood under the immense glass portico of the Grand Babylon, exposed to the raking stare of two commissionaires. So you are staying here, she said, as if laying hold of a fact which she had hitherto hesitated to touch. Yes, he said. Won't you come in? He took her into the rich gloom of the Grand Babylon, dashingly, fighting with the demon of shyness and beating it off with great loss. They sat down in a corner of the principal foyer, where a few electric lights drew attention to empty fauteuil and the blossoms of the Aubusson carpet. The world was at lunch. And a fine time I had getting your address, said she. Of course, I wrote at once to Selwood Terrace as soon as I got home, but I had the wrong number somehow, and I kept waiting and waiting for an answer, and the only answer I received was a returned letter. I knew I'd got the street right, and I said, I'll find that house if I have to ring every bell in Selwood Terrace, yes, and knock every knocker. Well, I did find it, and then they wouldn't give me your address. They said, letters would be forwarded, if you please. But I wasn't going to have any more letter business, no thank you. So I said, I wouldn't go without the address. It was Mr Duncan Fowles clerk that I saw, He's living there for the time being. A very nice young man. We got quite friendly. It seems Mr Duncan Fowle was in a state when he found the will. The young man did say that he broke a typewriter all to pieces. But the funeral being in Westminster Abbey consoled him. It wouldn't have consoled me. No, not it. However, he's very rich himself, so that doesn't matter. The young man said if I'd call again, he'd ask his master if he might give me your address. A rare fuss over an address, thought I to myself. But there lawyers. So I called again, and he gave it to me. I could have come yesterday. I very nearly wrote last night, but I thought on the whole I'd better wait till the funeral was over. I thought it would be nicer. It's over now, I suppose. Yes, said Priam Fowle. She smiled at him with grave sympathy, comfortably and sensibly. And right down relieved you must be, she murmured. It must have been very trying for you. In a way, he answered hesitatingly, it was. Taking off her gloves, she glanced round about her, as a thief must glance before opening the door. And then, leaning suddenly towards him, she put her hand to his neck and touched his collar. No, no, she said, let me do it. It's unbuttoned. The necktie was holding it in place, but it's quite loose now. There, I can do it. I see you've got two funny moles on your neck close together. How lucky. That's it. A final pat. Now no woman had ever patted Priam Fowle's necktie before, much less buttoned his collar, and still much less referred to the two little moles, one her suit, the other hairless, which the collar hid when it was properly buttoned. The experience was startling for him in the extreme. It might have made him very angry, had the hands of Mrs Chalice not been, well, nurse's hands, soft hands, persuasive hands, hands that could practice impossible audacities with impunity. Imagine a woman, uninvited and unpermitted, arranging his collar and necktie for him in the largest public room of the Grand Babylon, and then talking about his little moles. It would have been unimaginable. Yet it happened. And moreover, he had not disliked it. She sat back in her chair as though she had done nothing in the least degree unusual. I can see you must have been very upset, she said gently, though he has only left you a pound a week. Still, that's better than a bat in the eye with a burnt stick. A bat in the eye with a burnt stick reminded him vaguely of encounters with the police, otherwise it conveyed no meaning to his mind.
I hope you haven't got to go on duty at once, she said after a pause, because you really do look as if you needed a rest and a cup of tea or something like that. I'm quite ashamed to come bothering you so soon. Duty, he requested. What duty? Why, she exclaimed, haven't you got a new place? New place, he repeated after her. Well, what do you mean? Why is valet? There was certainly danger in his tendencies to forget that he was a valet. He collected himself. Uh, no, he said, I, I haven't got a new place. Then why are you staying here? she cried. I thought you were simply here with a new master. Why are you staying here alone? Oh, he replied, abashed. It seemed a convenient place. It was just by chance that I came here. Convenient place, indeed, she said stoutly. I never heard of such a thing. He perceived that he had shocked her, pained her. He saw that some ingenious defence of himself was required, but he could find none. So he said, in his confusion, Suppose we go and have something to eat. I do want a bit of lunch, as you say, now I come to think of it. Will you? What, here? she demanded apprehensively. Yes, he said. Why not? Well, come along, he said with fine casualness, and conducted her to the eight swinging glass doors that led to the salle à manger of the Grand Babylon. At each pair of doors was a living statue of dignity in cloth of gold. She passed these statues without a sign of fear, but when she saw the room itself steeped in a supra-genteel calm, full of gowns and hats and everything that you read about in the ladies' pictorial, and the pendant mast of a barge crossing the windows at the other end, she stopped suddenly. And one of the Lord Mayors of the Grand Babylon, wearing a mayoral chain, who had starved it out to meet them, stopped also. No, she said, I don't feel as if I could eat here. I really couldn't. But why? Well, she said, I couldn't fancy it somehow. Can't we go somewhere else? Certainly we can, he agreed with an eagerness that was more than polite. She thanked him with another of her comfortable, sensible smiles, a smile that took all embarrassment out of the dilemma, as balm will take irritation from a wound. And gently she removed her hat and gown and her gestures and speech and her comfortableness from those august precincts. And they descended to the grill room, which was relatively noisy, and where her roses were less conspicuous than the helmet of Navarre, and her frock found its sisters and cousins from far lands. I'm not much for these restaurants, she said, over grilled kidneys. No, he responded tentatively. I'm sorry, I, I thought the other night... Oh, yes, she broke in. I was very glad to go the other night to that place, very glad. But you see, I've never been in a restaurant before. Really? No, she said, and I felt as if I should like to try one. And the young lady at the post office had told me that that one was a splendid one. So it is, it's beautiful. But of course they ought to be ashamed to offer you such food. Now, do you remember that soul? Soul? There's no more soul than this love's soul. And if it had been cooked a minute, it had been cooked an hour, and waiting. And then look at the prices. Oh, yes, I couldn't help seeing the bill. I thought it was awfully cheap, said he. Well, I didn't, said she. When you think that a good housekeeper can keep everything going on tensionings ahead a week, why, it's simply scandalous. And I suppose this place is even dearer. He avoided the question. This is a better place altogether, he said. In fact, I don't know many places in Europe where one can eat better than one does here. Don't you? she said indulgently, as if saying, well, I know one at any rate. They say, he continued, that there is no butter used in this place that costs less than three shillings a pound. No butter costs them three shillings a pound, said she. Not in London, said he. They have it from Paris. And do you believe that? she said. Yes, he said. Well, I don't. Anyone that pays more than one and nine a pound for butter, at the most, is a fool, if you excuse me saying the word. Not but what that is good butter. I couldn't get as good in Putney for less than eighteen pence. She made him feel like a child who has a great deal to pick up from a kindly but firm sister. No, thank you, she said a little dryly to the waiter who had proffered us further supply of chipped potatoes. Now, don't say they're cold, Priam laughed. And she laughed also. Shall I tell you one thing that put me against these restaurants? She went on. It's the feeling you have that you don't know where the food's been. When you've got your kitchen close to your dining room, you can keep an eye on the stuff from the moment the cart brings it. Well then, you do know a bit where you are. And you can have your dishes served hot. It stands to reason, she said. 
Where's the kitchen here? Somewhere down below, he replied apologetically. A cellar kitchen, she exclaimed. Why, in Putney they simply can't let houses with cellar kitchens. No, no restaurants and hotels for me, not for choice, that is, regularly. And still, he said with a judicial air, hotels are very convenient. Are they? she said, meaning prove it. For instance, here there's a telephone in every room. You don't mean in the bedrooms? Yes, in every bedroom. Well, she said, you wouldn't catch me having a telephone in my bedroom. I should never sleep if I knew there was a telephone in the room. Fancy being forced to telephone every time you want. Well, and I always want to know who there is at the other end of the telephone. No, I don't like that. All that's all very well for gentlemen that haven't been used to what I call comfort, in a way of speaking, but... He saw that if he persisted, nothing soon would be left of that noble old pile, the Grand Babylon Hotel, save a heap of ruins. And further, she genuinely did cause him to feel that throughout his career he had always missed the very best things of life, through being an uncherished, ingenuous, easily satisfied man. A new sensation for him. For if any man in Europe believed in his own capacity to make others make him comfortable, Priam Fowle was that male. I've never been in Putney, he ventured on a new track. Difficulty of Truth-Telling As she informed him with an ungrudging particularity about Putney and her life at Putney, there gradually arose in his brain a vision of a kind of existence such as he had never encountered. Putney had clearly the advantages of a residential town in a magnificent situation. It lay on the slope of a hill whose foot was washed by a glorious stream entitled the Thames, its breast covered with picturesque barges and ornamental rowing boats. An arched bridge spanned this stream, and he went over the bridge in milk-white omnibuses to London. Putney had a street of handsome shops, a purely business street. No one slept there now because of the noise of motors. At eventide, the street glittered in its own splendours. There were theatre, music hall, assembly rooms, concert hall, market, brewery, library, and an afternoon tea shop exactly like Regent Street. Not that Mrs. Charis cared for their alleged China tea. Also, churches and chapels, and Barnes Common if you walked one way, and Wimbledon Common if you walked another. Mrs. Charis lived in Werter Road. Werter Road starting conveniently at the corner of the high street where the fish shop was an establishment where authentic soul was always obtainable, though it was advisable not to buy it on Monday mornings, of course. Putney was a place where you lived unvexed, untroubled. You had your little house and your furniture and your ability to look after yourself at all ends, and your knowledge of the prices of everything and your deep knowledge of human nature and your experienced forgiveness towards human frailties. You did not keep a servant because servants were so complicated and because they could do nothing whatever as well as you could do it yourself. You had a charwoman when you felt idle, or when you chose to put the house into the backyard for an airing. With the charwoman and a pair of gloves for coarser work and gas stoves, you made naught of domestic labour. You were never worried by ambitions, or by envy, or by the desire to know precisely what the wealthy did, and to do likewise. You read when you were not more amusingly occupied, preferring illustrated papers and magazines. You did not traffic with art to any appreciable extent, and you never dreamed of letting it keep you awake at night. You were rich, for the reason that you spent less than you received. You never speculated about the ultimate cause of things, or puzzled yourself concerning the possible developments of society in the next hundred years. When you saw a poor old creature in the street, you bought a box of matches off the poor old creature. The social phenomenon which chiefly roused you to just anger was the spectacle of wealthy people making money and so taking the bread out of the mouths of people who needed it. The only apparent blots of an existence at Putney were the noise and danger of the high street, the dearth of reliable laundries, the manners of a middle-aged lady engaged at the post office, Mrs. Chalice liked the other ladies in the post office, and the absence of a suitable man in the house. Existence at Putney seemed to Priam Fowle to approach the utopian. It seemed to breathe of romance, the romance of common sense and kindliness and simplicity. It made his own existence to that day appear a futile and unhappy striving after the impossible. Art? 
What was it? What did it lead to? He was sick of art, and sick of all the forms of activity to which he had hitherto been accustomed, and which he had mistaken for life itself. One little home, fixed and stable, rendered foolish the whole concourse of European hotels. I suppose you won't be staying here long, demanded Mrs. Chalice. Oh, no, he said. I shall decide something. Shall you take another place? she inquired. Another place? Yes. Her smile was excessively persuasive and inviting. I don't know, he said diffidently. You must have put a good bit by, she said, still with the same smile. Or perhaps you haven't. Saving's a matter of chance, that's what I always do say. It just depends how you begin. It's an habit. I'd never really blame anybody for not saving. And men? She seemed to wish to indicate that men were specially to be excused if they did not save. She had a large mind, that was sure. She understood things, and human nature in particular. She was not one of those creatures that a man meets with sometimes, creatures who are forever on the watch to pounce, and who are incapable of making allowances for any male frailty, smooth, smiling creatures with thin lips, hair a little scanty at the front, with a quietly omniscient, don't tell me, toe. Mrs. At Alice Chalice had a mouth as wide as her ideas, and a full underlip. She was a woman who, as it were, ran out to meet you when you started to cross the dangerous roadway which separates the two sexes. She comprehended because she wanted to comprehend, and when she could not comprehend, she would deceive herself that she did, which amounts to the equivalent. She was a living proof that in her sex social distinctions did not effectively count. Nothing counted where she was concerned, except a distinction far more profound than any social distinction, the historic distinction between Adam and Eve. She was balm to Priam Fowl. She might have been equally balm to King David, Uriah the Hittite, Socrates, Rousseau, Lord Byron, Heine, or Charlie Peace. She would have understood them all. They would all have been ready to cushion themselves on her comfortableness. Was she a lady? Pish! She was a woman. Her temperament drew Priam Fowl like an electrified magnet. To wander about freely in that roomy sympathy of hers seemed to him to be the supreme reward of experience. It seemed like the good inn after the bleak high road, the oasis after the sandstorm, shade after glare, the dressing after the wound, sleep after insomnia, surcease from unspeakable torture. He wanted, in a word, to tell her everything, because she would not demand any difficult explanations. She had given him an opening in her mention of savings. In reply to her suggestion, you must have put a good bit by, he could casually answer, yes, uh, £140,000. And that would lead by natural stages to a complete revealing of the fix in which he was. In five minutes he would have confided in her the principal details, and she would have understood and that he could describe his agonising and humiliating half-hour in the Abbey, and she would pour her magic oil on that dreadful abrasion of his sensitiveness. And he would be healed of his hurts, and they would settle between them what he ought to do. He regarded her as his refuge, as fate's generous compensation to him for the loss of Henry Leake, whose remains now rested in the National Valhalla. Only it would be necessary to begin the explanation, so that one thing might by natural stages lead to another. On reflection, it appeared rather abrupt to say, yes, a hundred and forty thousand pounds. The sum was too absurdly high, though correct. The mischief was that, unless the sum did strike her as absurdly high, it could not possibly lead by a natural stage to the remainder of the explanation. He must contrive another path, for instance, there has been a mistake about the so-called death of Priam Fowl. A mistake, she would exclaim, all ears and eyes. Then he would say, Yes, Priam Fowl isn't really dead. It's his valet that's dead. Whereupon she would burst out, But you were his valet. Whereupon he would simply shake his head and she would steam forwards, Then who are you? Whereupon he would say, as calmly as he could, I'm Priam Fowl. I'll tell you precisely how it all happened. Thus the talk might happen. Thus it would happen immediately he began. But, as at the dean's door in dean's yard, so now he could not begin. He could not utter the necessary words aloud. 
spoken aloud, they would sound ridiculous, incredible, insane. Not even Mrs. Chaddis could reasonably be expected to grasp their import, much less believe them. There's been a mistake about the so-called death of Priam Fall. Yes, £140,000. No, he could enunciate neither the one sentence nor the other. There are some truths so bizarre that they make you feel self-conscious and guilty before you have begun to state them. You state them apologetically. You blush. You stammer. You have all the air of one who does not expect belief. You look a fool. You feel a fool. And you bring disaster on yourself. He perceived with the most painful clearness that he could never, never impart to her the terrific secret, the awful truth. Great as she was, the truth was greater, and she would never be able to swallow it. What time is it? she asked suddenly. Oh, you mustn't think about time, he said with hasty concern. Results of Rain when the lunch was completely finished and the grill room had so far emptied that it was inhabited by no one except themselves and several waiters who had tried to force them to depart by means of thought transference and uneasy hovering round their table, Priam Far began to worry his brains in order to find some sane way of spending the afternoon in her society. He wanted to keep her, but he did not know how to keep her. He was quite at a loss. Strange that a man great enough and brilliant enough to get buried in Westminster Abbey had not sufficient of the small change of cleverness to retain the company of a Mrs. Alice Chaddis. Yet so it was. Happily, he was buoyed up by the thought that she understood. I must be moving off home, she said, putting her gloves on slowly and sighed. Let me see, he stammered. I think you said Werter Road, Putney? Yes, number 29. Perhaps... You'll let me call on you, he ventured. Oh, do, she encouraged him. Nothing could have been more correct and nothing more banal than this part of their conversation. He certainly would call. He would travel down to the idyllic Putney tomorrow. He could not lose such a friend, such a balm, such a soft cushion, such a comprehending intelligence. He would, bit by bit, become intimate with her, and perhaps ultimately he might arrive at the stage of being able to tell her who he was with some chance of being believed. Anyhow, when he did call, and he insisted to himself that it should be extremely soon, he would try another plan with her. He would carefully decide beforehand just what to say and how to say it. This decision reconciled him somewhat to a temporary parting from her. So he paid the bill, and under her sagacious protesting eyes, and he managed to conceal from those eyes the precise amount of the tip. And then, at the cloakroom, he furtively gave sixpence to a fat and wealthy man who had been watching over his hat and stick. Highly curious how those common-sense orbs of hers made all such operations seem excessively silly. And at last they wandered in silence through the corridors and antechambers that led to the courtyard entrance. And through the glass portals, Priam Fahl had a momentary glimpse of the reflection of light on a cabman's wet Macintosh. It was raining. It was raining very heavily indeed. All was dry under the glass-roofed colonnades of the courtyard, but the rain rattled like kettle drums on the glass, and the centre of the courtyard was a pond in which a few hansoms were splashing about. Everything, the horses' coats, the cabman's hats and capes, and the cabman's red faces, shone and streamed in the torrential summer rain. It is said that geography makes history. In England, and especially in London, weather makes a good deal of history. Impossible to brave that rain, except under the severest pressure of necessity. They were in shelter, and in shelter they must remain. He was glad, absurdly and splendidly glad. It can't last long, she said, looking up at the black sky, which showed an edge towards the east. Suppose we go in again and have some tea, he said. Now they had barely concluded coffee, but she did not seem to mind. Well, she said, it's always tea time for me. He saw a clock. It's nearly four, he said. Thus justified of the clock, in they went and sat down in the same seats which they had occupied at the commencement of the adventure in the main lounge. Priam discovered a bell push and commanded china tea and muffins. He felt that he now, as it were, had an opportunity of making a fresh start in life. He grew almost gay. 
He could be gay without sinning against decorum, for Mrs. Channis's singular tact had avoided all reference to deaths and funerals. And in the pause, while he was preparing to be gay, attractive, and in fact his truth self, she, calmly stirring China's tea, shot a bolt which made him see stars. It seems to me, she observed, that we might go farther and fare worse, both of us. He genuinely did not catch the significance of it in the first instance, and she saw that he did not. Oh, she proceeded, benevolently and reassuringly, I mean it. I'm not gallivanting about. I mean that if you want my opinion, I fancy we can make a match of it. It was at this point that he saw stars. He also saw a faint and delicious blush on her face, whose complexion was extraordinarily fresh and tender. She sipped china tea, holding each finger wide apart from the others. He had forgotten the origin of their acquaintance, forgotten that each of them was supposed to have a definite aim in view, forgotten that it was with a purpose that they had exchanged photographs. It had not occurred to him that marriage hung over him like a sword. He perceived the sword now, heavy and sharp, and suspended by a thread of appalling fragility. He dodged. He did not want to lose her, never to see her again. But he dodged. I couldn't think he began, and stopped. Of course, it's a very awkward situation for a man, she went on, toying with Muffin. I can quite understand how you feel. And with most folks, you'd be right. There's very few women that can judge character, and if you started to try and settle something at once, they'd just set you down as a wrong un. But I'm not like that. I don't expect any fiddle-faddle. What I like is plain sense and plain dealing. We both want to get married, so it would be silly to pretend we didn't, wouldn't it? And it would be ridiculous of me to look for courting and a proposal and all that sort of thing, just as if I'd never seen a man in his shirt sleeves. The only question is, shall we suit each other? I've told you what I think. What do you think? She smiled, honestly, kindly, but piercingly. What could he say? What would you have said, you being a man? It is easy sitting there in your chair with no Mrs. Alice Chalice in front of you to invent diplomatic replies. But conceive yourself in Priam's place. Besides, he did think she would suit him. And most positively, he could not bear the prospect of seeing her pass out of his life. He'd been through that experience once when his hat blew off in the tube, and he did not wish to repeat it. Of course, you've got no home, she said reflectively with such compassion. Suppose you come down and just have a little peep at mine. So that evening, a suitably paired couple chanced into the fishmongers at the corner of Werter Road and bought a bit of sole. At the newspaper shop next door but one, placard said, Impressive scenes of Westminster Abbey. Foul funeral stately pageant. Great painter laid to rest. Etc. End of chapter 5